Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, I'm delighted to welcome Alex Farnell, who will be presenting today's seminar. Um, Alex recently gained his PhD from Lancaster University on labour markets in prof professional sports. Uh, he recently took up a post as lecturer in economics at Maynooth University. His work focuses broadly on labour and personnel economics using data from professional sports to include football, NFL, baseball, etc. And he has published on the causes of head coach replacements in European football. So today, Alex is going to be presenting to us on COVID-19 infection and short uh, run worker performance evidence from European football. So um, Alex's work um, and that of his co-authors today um, have looked at COVID-19 infections representing a recurrent and a relatively homogenous source of workplace absenteeism. They use a matched employee-employer data set of footballers contracted to European football clubs who have tested positive for COVID-19. And overall, their results show that while raw performance measures are adversely affected, the effect is short-lived in terms of two to three games before recovery. But obviously, he will be presenting more detailed results than that. And again, can I remind you that we will be taking questions through the Q&A format at the end of the seminar. So without further ado, Alex, um, over to you. Uh, brilliant. Thanks very much for the, for the nice introduction. And thanks very much for the, uh, for the invite to come and talk as well. Uh, really looking forward to hearing comments, questions, suggestions that you might have. Um, so yeah, we're looking at COVID-19 infections and short-run work performance evidence from European football. And this is some joint work with uh, David and Robbie Butler down at UCC uh, and Rob Simmons uh, from Lancaster. Uh, I believe David and Rob Simmons are on the uh, on the call as well. They said they they might uh, they might come along. So if you have got any uh, complicated questions. Uh, then feel free to uh, to ask them as we go along. Okay, so without further ado, um, of course we know COVID has had massive implications on various different industries, different individuals, different workers over the last eighteen months or so, uh, and football footballers um, are certainly no exception to that. Um, so one example of a player who's caught COVID is Paul Pogba, uh, Manchester United France midfielder. Um, and you can just see from his quote there, this was an interview he gave back in uh, December, saying, you know, the first game of the season, I couldn't run. Um, I was very out of breath and it took me a long time to get back, uh, get back my fitness. But much like the, the whole of the population, the rest of the population, we know that COVID doesn't necessarily have identical effects on everyone. Um, and no one really sums this up better than, uh, than Zlatan Ibrahimovic. If you want a good quote from a footballer, Zlatan is normally the, the best place to start, and, uh, and this certainly delivers. He says, no symptoms whatsoever. COVID had the courage to challenge me. Uh, bad idea. So typical Zlatan kind of uh, language there. So where does all this uh, fit into to an economics framework? Well, of course, what we have with COVID-19 infections is a source of recurrent workplace absenteeism or a source of work, uh, worker sickness. And what we're asking here is how do workers recover from what is a potentially physically debilitating illness um, upon their return to work? So our explicit focus here really is the, is the return to work. So it's a very short term kind of effect. Yes, we know that there are potential um, avenues to go and look at long COVID, um, but our, our explicit focus here is very much on the short term effect um, when they return to work. Now, it's a really interesting setting to look at this because, of course, what we have in the football labour market is workers are extremely high value. Of course, they're traded between different teams um, at extremely high prices. They're paid extremely high wages. It's a job that requires extreme levels of, of, of fitness. And we can think about fitness as being both a physical kind of fitness and also a mental fitness as well. Of course, you need um, immense concentration to play uh, 90 minutes of a football match. And of course, these footballers have access to possibly the best medical facilities um, that are out there, um, certainly maybe a lot better than, than the average population. So it's an, uh, an interesting setting to, to look at this, uh, this question. Now, we know, of course, that um, work time lost to illness or sickness is an important international issue. So just some, some stats here. The World Health Organization estimate that in the EU, uh, something like 12 days per worker per year are lost due to illness or injury and similar kind of statistics coming out from the US, the Bureau of Labor Statistics say about 2% of working time 
uh, is lost in the US due to sickness. But in terms of how they translate into effects at the individual worker level and how they affect individual productivity, we don't really know that much about it. And, and what we do know tends to come from either survey data or measures of self-reported uh, performance or productivity. I've uh, got two examples uh, down below, the Keish paper in 98 and Lutter in 05. Probably the one that's most closely related to, uh, to COVID is of course the one about flu and flu-like symptoms and, and workers reported that they were incapacitated for about two and a half days whilst they had COVID. And even when they returned to work, um, they still had reduced effectiveness for about three and a half days um, after that. Now, one exception to this, um, not necessarily focusing on COVID explicitly, but one paper where we do know um, about individual worker effects using employer-employee match data is from Grinzer and Ricks, uh, published in 2020. And they have data on privately owned Belgian firms over an eight year period. And what they find is that for about a 1% increase in the rate of sickness absenteeism, they find that a productivity uh, de uh, declines by about 0.66%. Now that effect wasn't necessarily uniform. Um, they found it was particularly pronounced amongst higher tenured workers, argument being, is that if you're a higher tenure worker, then you've probably got more kind of firm knowledge or task specific knowledge, and it's more difficult to find a replacement for those higher tenured workers. Um, also more pronounced amongst smaller firms, and quite obviously it's harder to replace one worker out of, out of a workforce of 10 than it is one worker out of a, a workforce of a thousand, for example. Um, and it was also more pronounced where workers um, relied much more on each other. So a higher degree of worker to worker connectivity rather than say, um, relying more on technology or, or various other bits of capital, for example. Now, the literature we do have on COVID-19 um, tends to, at the moment at least, focus on the effect of public health interventions. So for example, what's the effect on productivity of working from home or, or remote working, rather than necessarily looking at the effect of the virus itself. Now, one exception we do have to that comes from the sports world and actually comes from NBA, which is National Basketball Association. Um, Van Dryl uh, published something earlier this year in a medical journal uh, looking at players in the NBA who'd recovered from COVID, uh, and they actually found no effects upon their return to, uh, to playing these matches. Um, but as you can see there, we might want to take that with a pinch of salt because there was only a sample size of, uh, of 20. Um, another paper that we might want to, to look at is Lichter et al, who published uh, in Labour Econ in 2017. And they were looking at the effects of air pollution uh, and how that impacted uh, player performance in the German Bundesliga. Now, of course, air pollution is, is quite different to COVID in the sense that it's, a, it's kind of a continuous effect, whereas what we have with COVID is more of a one-time uh, shock. Uh, so that's one difference. And the, and the other difference here is that their uh, measure or their outcome measure here is number of passes. Now, number of passes is a measure that's used quite often in kind of evaluations of, of sport and performance. Um, but we try and stay away from number of passes uh, with, uh, with this work. Um, and I'll explain the performance measures that we do use as we go through. But the reason we, we don't really like number of passes as a measure is that you can still pass the ball. Um, you might not pass it as well, but you can still pass the ball um, maybe if you feel another bit under the weather. So what we try and focus on are measures that actually are likely to reflect struggles to your, um, to your respiratory system. So it puts pressure on your, on your lungs and your circulatory system. Um, and I'll explain those measures in more detail as we, as we go through, of course. Okay, so uh, why football? Why do we want to visit this issue with, uh, with football and, and with COVID? Uh, well, one, one big advantage is that it's fairly easy to track uh, who had COVID. Um, so players put it on their Twitter, their Instagram accounts. Um, quite often, certainly in the past, clubs would also disclose um, who had COVID. They're doing it less and less now as, um, as we get into kind of issues of medical confidentiality. But it's also quite easy just to tell because um, players or a manager would say, we've got two players out this week. Um, with COVID, we're not naming who they are, but then you see the match day lineup uh, and two players who are normally involved um, aren't involved in the squad anymore and they've not been given a, another injury reason. So it's normally pretty easy to determine uh, who, has, uh, who has COVID. Uh, 
And the other big advantage is that we can get much more accurate uh, measures of worker performance as opposed to say con other conventional settings or non-sporting settings. And that means that it's much easier to track output both before and after um, infection. Now, I don't really wanna get into um, what is an issue, not just with maybe this paper, but with uh, sports econ more generally, the usual criticism that's leveled at it is, uh, is one of external validity. So how can we uh, abstract away from this sporting setting if we wanted to go to a more general labor market setting? Of course, we've mentioned that these are highly valued workers, they've got access to world-class medical facilities, etc. So how can we abstract away from that? Now, I don't really wanna get into that just to make you aware that we, uh, that we are aware of this issue uh, when it comes to, to looking at the results. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the data. Um, we've identified 229 players um, who've tested positive for COVID-19 uh, and they come from 57 different clubs. Um, so uh, Dave Butler did a really good job collecting this. It's a manually constructed data set where we were tracking um, player social media pages and, and various other reputable sources um, of COVID-19 disclosure. We look at the top five European leagues of the so-called big five European leagues. That's the Premier League, that's England, uh, Liga, which is France, Bundesliga, which is Germany, Serie A, Italy, and La Liga, which is Spain. Uh, and we take uh, a 10 game performance spell, uh, which includes five games before their infection date and five games after this infection date. And we then pair those 10 game or that 10 game spell with performance data from a source called StatsBomb, okay? There are a couple of restrictions that we make to this data. Um, one is that we only focus on what we call elite games. Um, and by that, we mean league matches and European club matches. So European club matches, there would be the Champions League or the UEFA Europa League. And what we're doing by that restriction there is that we're excluding domestic cup games. So in England, that would be the FA Cup and the, uh, whatever it's called now, the, the Carabao Cup or something, what used to be the League Cup. And, and the reason we do this is because what, what we see is that teams quite often rotate their squads uh, in these matches. So that it's not necessarily going to be the first team that plays here. They're going to give some minutes to maybe some younger players. They're going to give some minutes to, to reserves. Um, so we exclude for that reason. Uh, and the other thing that we do is we exclude goalkeepers, partly because it's more difficult to get um, good measures of performance about how do you define good goalkeeper performance. Okay, so to act as a comparison group, um, we actually have a control group um, of non-infected players. And we spent quite a bit of time thinking about what's the best way to form this control group. In particular, what's the best time frame to get this control group from? So again, we look at a 10 game spell um, and we chose the time period between January, 2020 and March, 2020. So the 10 game spell in there. Importantly, this was before the leagues were suspended. Um, which was kind of mid to late March. And we look at the period before any infections um, were actually recorded. Um, so hopefully it's a period of time where the game was as normal as possible. There were no players having to self-isolate. Um, there were no kind of disruption to training patterns. All those things we think would give us um, a much better comparison. Again, a couple of restrictions that we place on this control group um, to try and get a fair distribution of talent because in the infected group, we see quite a few call them elite players uh, being infected with COVID to try and get a, an equal distribution of talent. We select the minimum of two players from the top European clubs. So they would be Real Madrid, Barcelona, Juventus, Bayern Munich, et cetera. And the other thing that we were really conscious to do is that we wanted to try and match um, as good as possible the positions from the treatment and control group. And I don't mean that just in terms of defence, midfield, attack. I actually mean more in detail. So, for example, if we look at a fullback, right back, left back, compared to a centre back, both within defence, it's expected that the fullbacks are going to be doing more running, more pressing than a centre back, for example. But the centre back might have the ball more often and might be doing more passing. Uh, so it was quite important, I think, that we managed to, to match up those positions between the treatment uh, and control group. So now we come on to look at how we define uh, performance. We've actually got six measures of performance that we look at, or maybe more broadly measures of fitness. Uh, one is minutes. So the number of minutes uh, that players play per game. Uh, obviously football matches normally last uh, 90 minutes, but because we have some European fixtures in there that went to extra time, uh, we do observe some players playing up to 120 minutes. 
Um, we then have the number of presses, which is the number of times that a player applies pressure to an opposing player when that opposing player is either receiving, carrying, or releasing the ball. Okay, so that's about pressurizing the opponent. We have a measure called progressive distance, which is the total number of yards that you move towards the opposition goal with the ball at your feet. Uh, and then we have the number of carries as well, which is simply the number of times that you control the ball uh, at your feet. Now we can think about those measures uh, one to four as being more kind of measures of physical fitness. But what we know from COVID is that it's maybe not just about a physical effect, there's also a mental, uh, a possible mental effect or a psychological effect. We've heard about, for example, mind fog uh, when you've been uh, infected with COVID. And as an attempt to try and tease out some of the effects uh, to do with that, we look at pass completion percentage, which is just the number of passes or the, the percent of passes that found a teammate. Uh, and we also look at expected goals um, as well. Um, now I've got some charts in a second that mean that we're not necessarily comfortable with measures five and six. Um, and you'll see why, but even more uh, kind of subtly, um, as a measure pass completion percentage, it will depend on whether you're attempting, for example, short passes, long passes, medium range passes, that's necessarily going to affect how, how likely it is that those passes are completed. So we're not necessarily overly confident with that measure um, uh, as a measure of performance. Um, let's just talk about expected goals for a second. If you're not aware what expected goals are, um, for, for a long time, it was kind of a, a very much a sports analytics measure, um, but it's now increasingly becoming a, a much more widely used measure of performance. So, for example, if you watch Match of the Day on a Saturday night, um, one of the stats that they will go through is now expected goals. So it's becoming a much more widely used um, measure of performance. Essentially, what expected goals is asking is how likely is it that a player is going to score from a particular chance? And that probability is based on shots that were taken from that same spot on the field in past games. Okay, so we've got a heat map here on the right hand side, which is for Erling Haaland, he's a striker for Borussia Dortmund. Um, the dots are shots that were taken. If they're in yellow, it means they went into the goal. If, uh, if they're in green, then they didn't go into the goal. So you can see for these kind of four yellow blobs right in front of the goal, two, three yards out, there's a pretty high probability that you're gonna score. And the size of these, these dots represents the probability. So there's a pretty high probability that you'll score from just two or three yards out. But if we look at the one, um, I hope you can see my mouse, but if we look at the, the dot on the right-hand side of the goal, right by the, uh, the, the outline, then because it's a really tight angle, there's a really low probability that that was gonna go in. Uh, but he did somehow manage to, uh, to squeeze that in. So that's what we mean by, by expected goals. Um, and then over the course of a match, what you do is you just sum up um, the, the probability that each of these shots uh, went in. Okay, so here are some descriptives. Uh, this is for the whole sample, both the treatment and control groups um, merged together. Uh, we've got our six outcomes, um, and then when we come to uh, to do some to do the modeling side of things, we've got some uh, covariates as well that might explain potential differences in performance. So we've got the age of the player, we've got the opposition ELO rating, uh, which is a measure of, of opposition strength. Now we think this is a really important measure to include because if you ask a player in advance of a game, how are you going to perform today? Well, I suspect a big part of that answer is going to depend on well, who we're going to be playing up against today. If they're a big team, a good team then our performance might be, um, might be worse, for example. So that's something that's really important to control for. That's the opposition ELO rating. Uh, we have a Europe dummy, which is simply asking, is that club still involved in a European competition? So the Champions League or the UEFA Europa League. And that's important because then we can start to get into discussions about how, how much the managers rotate their squad when it comes to league games versus these European fixtures. Um, we control for positions. Um, midfield, the defenders and attackers. Um, so as we said, excluding goalkeepers. And then we also control for the league as well. So those five leagues. And that's potentially important. Um, you might remember that England decided to stick with the three subs rule, whereas France, Germany, Italy and Spain all decided to stay with the five substitutes rule. Um, and there might be just more subtle differences, such as the level of intensity in these different leagues, different play styles. Um, so it's important to control for the leagues that they're coming from as well.
We can also split up these uh, statistics by group. Um, so again, for the outcomes, we would expect to see that these, um, these outcomes are lower, um, mainly apart from past completion percentage. Uh, and then I think we've done a pretty good job, it seems, of matching up with these covariates as well, um, possibly with the exception of Europe. So remember, this is the, um, the, the amount of uh, all the teams that are involved in European competitions. Uh, and the other thing to notice is that we seem to have a pretty high proportion of players in the treatment group that come from Italy, uh, which is maybe not too surprising because, of course, that's where the, uh, the outbreak in Europe uh, centred on right at the start of the pandemic. So these are our outcome measures um, plotted before and after um, uh, infection. So game, uh, games one to five are pre-infection, games six to 10 are post-infection. The dotted line uh, is the treatment group, the solid black line is the control group. What you can see for the treatment group for minutes, presses, progressive distance and carries is that there is a pretty sharp drop off uh, in performance in the game immediately after infection, which is represented by that horizontal line, or that vertical line rather. Um, but there does seem to be a pretty quick recovery. So kind of two or three games later, um, they seem to be performing largely back to where they were um, before. Um, and also importantly is that we see a reasonably similar um, trend emerging in the control group as well before treatment for those four measures. But for past completion percentage and expected goals, um, it seems to be a little bit all over the place. So I was saying we're a little bit cautious about interpreting the results from those two measures, past completion and expected goals. And this is the reason, because they don't seem to be following any kind of similar trend um, before that infection period took place. So let's get on to the methodology. Um, you've probably seen where this has been coming for a couple of slides, talking about treatment and control groups. Uh, but what we do is we set up a difference in differences. So we're looking at the performance of player I in, uh, in game T, where of course games T uh, one to five is the pre-infection period, game six to 10 is the post-infection period. Uh, treat is a dummy variable if we're if it's the treatment group, so infected players, post is a dummy variable looking at the post-infection period. So of course, what we're then interested in is this diff and diff coefficient here, this beta TP, which is gonna be uh, treat times post is gonna to equal to one if we're looking at the infected players in the post-infected period. Um, we can also control for these potentially important characteristics. So we've got the age of the player uh, as well as age squared and also these positional dummies uh, as well. Uh, and then we've got some game characteristics as well. So opposition ELO rating, this is opposition strength, um, a European dummy, are they still involved in European football, uh, and then league dummies as well. Um, what we can also do and what we do in later specifications is we include minutes as a potential control variable. Um, and you'll see why that becomes really important um, as we go through. So these are some results. Um, what we're doing here, difference between panel A, panel B is, of course, we're just adding in the controls and we're adding in all the controls except for minutes played. So we're not controlling for minutes played in panel B. And you can see in both cases, what we see from this diff in diff coefficient here is that we see uh, a fall in the number of minutes played, fall in the number of presses, um, players are um, uh, progressive distances falling, they're carrying the ball fewer times. Uh, and the number of expected goals falls as well. We're not seeing anything significant going on here with past completion percentage. Um, now that could be to do with this uh, parallel trends that we spoke about earlier, but also remember that past completion is already kind of a relative statistic. It's not a raw statistic like the number of presses uh, or the number of carries. Um, now, instead of looking at just a pre-post uh, kind of average, what we can do is we can split that up by just looking um, at the game dummies instead. So looking at uh, games two through to game 10 here with game one acting as the uh, emitted category. And this allows us to look for a kind of a, 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 um, a recovery period. Um, and I think that emerges quite well for the number of presses um, and the number of carries as well, also perhaps for um, progressive distance. But we can see kind of after two, three games, then there's no significant differences between performance pre and post uh, for these infected players. Okay, so what we've said so far is that performance does seem to be falling uh, in raw terms. So raw number of 
presses raw number of carries do seem to be falling. But what we've also showed is that number of minutes played on the pitch is also falling as well. Um, so why would that be? Well, it could just be that they're not fit enough to play 90 minutes anymore after their infection. Or it could be that it's an active decision by management, so by the head coach, the coaching staff, probably with advice from the medical staff to say, you know, they've had an infection, let's just manage the number of minutes that they've got on the pitch upon their return from COVID. So maybe we shouldn't be too surprised that if they're playing fewer minutes, then the number of presses that they have, the number of carries that they have is going to fall. So this is where the importance of controlling for the number of minutes played on the pitch comes into play. And we can see when we do that for presses, progressive distance and carries, that diff in diff term now becomes insignificant. So there's no difference between, um, between the infected players pre and post compared to the control group. Um, the importance of controlling for minutes, well, that behaves exactly, exactly as we'd expect. So the more minutes you have on the pitch, the more number of presses, uh, the higher your progressive distance, and also the higher the number of carries that you have um, as well. I think what's quite telling as well from these regressions explaining the importance of minutes is if we just go back a few slides and look at the R squareds as we go through and start adding in controls, we're virtually not explaining any of the variation here at all in, uh, in these outcomes. It's getting a little bit better when we add in the controls apart from minutes. But by the time we add in minutes as a regressor, we're now explaining about a third of the variation in these, uh, in these, performance, um, in these different performance measures. So I think that really highlights the importance of, of, the, uh, of adding in minutes as a control variable. So just a quick couple of robustness checks um, that we've done to make you aware of. We're of course aware that getting COVID isn't the only thing that's gonna um, hinder these players uh, getting minutes. Um, one would be from what happens if these players um, get COVID while the leagues were suspended. So the leagues, if you remember, were suspended for about two, three months, uh, maybe a little bit longer. So if you get COVID right at the start of that period, then you're not going to be playing another football match again for, for 100 days. So you're probably going to have enough time to, uh, to recover. The same would be true as if you've got a COVID infection during the summer break. Again, you've got another couple of months off before you play your next football game. So we might not be saying the same effect um, of, uh, of COVID if you get um, COVID over the summer break. For example, quite a few players went on holidays. They had international duties with their, with their international teams. And we saw quite a few players picking up COVID uh, during that period. Other couple of smaller things, well, you might be transferred to a different team. Um, they might have different training regimes. They might uh, restrict your minutes in the first couple of games that you're playing to get used to things. Um, and of course, you might get another injury as well. Um, but we've only identified very few cases of that happening. So to try and control for all these different things, what we do is we just look at the treatment group. So we're, we're moving away from the diff and diff um, strategy here. Um, and we just look at the pre-post, um, uh, a pre-post dummy for the treatment group. And we interact those with a dummy for the presence of these four different things. Um, and as you can see, um, highlighted by the importance of, or, or the insignificance rather of these interaction terms, um, they're not getting in the way uh, of observing the main effect of COVID. Um, another couple of things that we've done, we've also investigated the role of clusters. Um, so what might happen is the player gets COVID, but they may be asymptomatic or they have a test a couple of days later and they've already been in close proximity with the rest of the squad. So Atletico Madrid was, was probably the best example of this. So what we do is we investigate the role of we call it a cluster dummy which is if four players were infected within quite close proximity to each other, um, and the results are, are robust to including that as well. Um, of course, COVID itself might be, might be a homogenous infection, but the effects of it certainly, certainly aren't. We know that from just looking at, um, at the difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic COVID. Um, so to try and get a, a handle on this, we can look, uh, or we can add in as a control, um, again, just looking at the treated groups, abstracting away from the diff and diff, um, including a measure of the potency of infection, which we measure as the number of days between your positive COVID test uh, and your next appearance. Again, this doesn't affect, um, affect the results. Um, and what the other thing that we do is we compare the average of these infected players to their performance averages from the previous season. 
Uh, and again, the same results emerge. So as soon as we control for the number of minutes that you play on the pitch in that post infection period, then those differences, um, those differences cancel each other out. So just before we kind of go on to uh, any questions, comments that you might have, how can we kind of sum this up, maybe think about more broader uh, implications? Um, so you remember what we found so far is that we've had uh, a decline in the number of minutes played, a decline in the raw performance statistics, but as soon as we account for that decline in the number of minutes played, then these differences in performance seem to cancel each other out. So we think that this actually points to a highly effective management strategy, probably uh, being advised by the medical people, the, uh, the, the club doctors, etc. So, you know, these guys have been infected with COVID, but maybe if we manage their minutes uh, upon their return, then their performance might not be too different. And of course, they've got access to world-class medical facilities that we've already, uh, that we've already spoken about. Um, and I think this is kind of reassuring uh, for the rest of us, really, because if under those circumstances that these people who are some of the fittest people in the world, they've got world-class medical facilities, if we can't see these people recovering um, from COVID, then I don't think it really paints the best picture um, for the rest of us um, in, in society. Um, but that's pretty much it. So uh, looking forward Thank to, very much. to hearing any, any questions, etc.